going to be dealing in with agricultural issues. You want to know, you know, who can support you out there when, uh, when you identify an issue or if the DAO or the key leaders that you're working with. And so Gary is from the Roots of Peace organization. It's just one of many non-governmental organizations, known as NGOs, that are uh, working in Afghanistan. And uh, I think you'll find Gary's presentation particularly interesting because he has also angled it in a way uh, to explain how the NGO community can support you out there and how you can support the NGO community. So it's a, it's a very interesting presentation on, on how, what the synergies are. Uh, so Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, so I, I think I'm the last pre presenter today. You are. Yeah, yeah, some wine this afternoon. And I uh, think you bring some Afghan food, so uh, the last one. So as we go through this, uh, keep it very informal. If you've got questions, just fire them out there. Uh, it'll help me direct what I say, what I focus on. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, primarily about how Roots of Peace, which is a nonprofit organization, we're a humanitarian charitable organization, how we work in Afghanistan. And uh, we focus primarily on agriculture, but we also have built some schools and done some construction. Uh, but the work that we do is applicable to doing almost any projects in Afghanistan. So everything that I'm going to be focused on really is how to do projects in Afghanistan. Uh, the rest of the week, you're going to learn a lot about, you know, they're going to make you dangerous and with a little bit of knowledge on agriculture, but you're also going to get input in from people from the government, the USAID, USDA, people, you've already had some of the schools here. So I am the NGO side of this equation here. And there's a lot of NGOs that operate in Afghanistan. We're just one of them. We've been there since 2003. Uh, we've implemented over 35 programs in Afghanistan, so we've got a little bit of experience there. Uh, and right now we're operating some of the major agricultural programs there. Uh, we've got about $110 million in funding uh, for the projects. But we have a kind of a unique approach. Not everyone does things the way we do, so I'll show you how we do things, and you can you know, take the good parts, leave what you want. Uh, as Paul mentioned, some, one of the first key messages, you're not alone. Uh, you just went through an e-Afghan ag presentation. Uh, I don't think you go to any other country in the world and find that quality of information or extensive amount of information on the country. So that is a huge resource. When I, when I first went there in 2003, uh, one of the guys from UC Davis, Pat Brown, and I actually drove all over the country and we were using um, satellite imagery with best guesses on what the crops were based on satellite imagery. And they were wrong about 90% of the time. So we actually mapped where the grape production was. And that was the first thing we were looking at, grapes and almonds. So now you, even before you get to Kandahar, Helmand, or wherever you're going, you, know, you could go and look at the profiles and learn quickly what took us a couple of years to figure out. The other thing is that the quick and meaningful impact is possible. Translation is they need a lot of help and you can help them. Uh, capacity building of the dales. Does everyone know what a dale is? Or you got that? Okay. Building the dales is, is possible. They're coming from a very, very low level and, and we can help them start doing things on their own and so that the organizations like Roots Peace can go home and we don't have to do that work anymore. So, so we started talking about NGOs. I will go through our Roots of Pieces development approach, which I think there's a few good things in there, and some case studies. All of these studies that are, and, and approaches are all agriculture, but they're applicable to doing a school or building a bridge, working with canals. It's the same idea, same process we use for all of our activities, and whether we're working in Vietnam or West Bank or Afghanistan. And also talk a little bit about working with mail, working with the military, there's some issues. You've already got some input in there from John. But the, is this in focus? I can't really. Yeah, my eyes. Can you guys read that okay? Okay. It's also in there both here. So. Okay. So these are the six major programs going on in agriculture that are funded by USAID. There's also programs from World Bank and EC. USAID is the big dog, and they have the most money, so these are the ones uh, that you'll hear most about. CHAMP is a program that we're, Roots Peace is doing. It's in RC East and South. Uh, it's a commercial program. We're working with farmers to make them commercial 
uh, operations. So far, we've planted 20,000 new orchards and vineyards. We're working a lot in the south. So when you get down there, uh, you, you definitely want to link in with the teams there on what they're doing. Uh, idea new is winding down. They're kind of doing a little bit like Champ is, but they're east, north, and west. They've got another few months left. And there's these new programs starting up. All of these will start up while you're there. The Regional Agricultural Development Program. There's one in the south. The bid is uh, in process to determine who's going to do that work. There's our uh, rat up for west, rat up for north, and then there's going to be a rat up in the central area that's supposed to coordinate all the activities and work with mail. So I imagine, are all you guys going to south? Is anyone not going to south? We don't know. We don't know. You don't know yet? No. It's a rumor that you're going south? <laughs> OK. You're going to Afghanistan? That's good. You know when you're going to Afghanistan? October. Well, that's good. Usually they don't even know that. That's a great time to go, by the way, for agriculture. After the harvest is when everything starts. So that's a good time. Uh, Agrid is another important program. Ritzpiece is also doing that one. That is to train Mail and Dale how to implement projects, research and extension projects. That's a five-year program. We're eight months, nine months into that. We're basically responsible for making the Dales responsive to the farmers. So a lot of programs are working with the Dales to support them also. So it's this, we don't have uh, complete ownership of the Dales, but we're one of them. And we want to kind of try and coordinate with everybody who's talking to the Dales. So when you, if you get down there and you start wanting to do things with the Dales, please get the agri team involved and coordinate what you're doing and make sure we're in sync with them. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit how you could work better with Agrid and work with Martin and, I'm sorry, Mail and Dale uh, when we get into this. Afghan Agricultural Extension Program is run by UC Davis, and uh, that's kind of one of our partner programs with Agrid. They're setting up pilots on how to work more effectively in extension. The Agrid program is going to take those projects. On the, of the chief of parties were on that page. What you find is if you want to connect with these guys, you can connect them just by contacting the chief of party, and they'll get you connected in with their regional guy or, or one of their deputies, or they'll work with you directly. So chief of parties are typically very open to work with you, so don't, don't worry about going in and talking to these guys right away. So Roots Peace, as I mentioned, has a different development approach. First of all, when we work out in the field, this is, uh, I think, in Jalalabad, it's in the wintertime. That's where we do almost all our training. Uh, we do a very low-key approach. Which piece has almost 400 employees in the country, and we operate in almost every province. And we operate 724. We nonstop. If there's conflicts going on in the area, we'll just shift a little bit over the side. Okay. We hire from that area. We hire very wisely from that area. We get people who are well connected into that tribal st structure in that area. And so we can work with the farm communities very effectively. This is a typical extension training. You get one guy working with 20, 25 guys. <clears throat> and that's, there's the extension message up there. Uh, we typically do just-in-time training. They're going to teach these guys probably pruning and how to go out and prune their trees. And so they're getting the training. Then they're going to go out into this orchard there, and they'll do the pruning. And then they'll go out and check on the guys the week after and see how it's, how it's gone through there. And if there's inputs like pruning shears that are involved, they'll get, that's when they'll get the pruning shears, and they'll go do that. So we do this thousands and thousands of times. Here, maybe I can just uh, interject something here, guys. 
So, for example, if that's maybe a high priority in your area after you uh, get to know your Dale, that uh, that the pruning of fruit trees uh, will improve the, uh, the quality or so, this might be an opportunity for you to say, okay, maybe we can figure out how we can hook up with uh, with roots and keys if there's a need for the technical expertise. Yeah, yeah. And there's a number of ways you can hook up with roots and keys or other NGOs. Right. So, in one case, let's say uh, you're interested and you wanted to support the marketing of uh, melons, those round melons that you saw, shipping them to Dubai. You know, the CHAMP program's got commercial uh, activity going on already and traders, we have trade offices in Dubai. So we could work with you on things like that and do exports. Last year, we shipped uh, melons from Spin Boldak. It was a program that was started by the PRT. The PRT is winding down. We picked it up and worked with them until the PRT left and then carried it through. Uh, we don't like picking them up like that in the end. We'd rather be involved in the beginning of the process. So there are things that we could do that we already have funding for. And, you, and there's some synergies with, by working with uh, people in the field. It could help your efforts also by doing connecting with the, the local groups. But also, it could help us by getting other ways that we can get things done that we may not have been able to do before. So. Uh, that's one way. The other way is, let's say you want to get in, connected, you want to do a specific little project, we can connect you to small organizations that might do a small project or it's bigger Roots of Peace or other organizations we can connect you to, to doing things like that. Roots of Peace has done a number of projects with, with uh, SERP funds and, and State Department funds. And, uh, we typically do bigger programs, but if they're strategic type projects, we'll, we'll dive in on those. So it's like the first type you're using. Uh, subterranean cellars for apples in, in Logar. We just built this $60,000 project, but it's really important because the pilot, once you get the pilot established, then it can grow a lot from there. So here's, here's my quick 10. And again, this could be, you could apply this to other activities, but uh, you should determine what crops are in your location. So if, once you find out where you're going, I'd go to the EFGAN Ag, go to the province and figure out there's going to be two or three crops that are important. You know, the wheat's important everywhere, goats and sheep are important everywhere, and, the, and poultry. But the next crops are the ones you really want to zero in on, the, uh, the high market value crops. Because Afghanistan's jewel is the fact that it can produce temperate crops, uh, perennial crops. California is nothing but fruits and nuts. The main thing is fruits and nuts in California. Okay, there are not very many places like California in the world that produce crops like this. Afghanistan produces really good pomegranates, really good grapes, melons. These are phenomenal. Uh, they sell in the Indian markets at the 30 to 50 percent premium over fruit from California, you know, which is in pretty good shape. So the high value crops are, are something that they really take pride in and they make a lot of money on. So it's, that's good to understand which are those crops. And then you have to understand kind of the, the rough value chain. You guys all know what value chains are, right? Everything from the farm to fork and in between. You have to look for where are there problems along the way. There's a lot of information on EFGAN Ag, on Roots Pieces website, other websites about these value chains. And you can figure out with just reading a couple of documents and kind of understand what's going on and where they need help. And then if you're going to do, do work yourself, figure out where you're going to do the work. And you really want to make sure you pick the best opportunities for you. You don't want to go in and pick an opportunity that's a very difficult thing to do. It's going to take a long time. It's going to only do 5%, 10% improvement. You should go after things that are going to improve yields 50 to 100%. And that you're going to have a very visible impact and are not going to have to do all kinds of complex things in order to happen. So really scrutinize what you're going to do and determine how hard it is because Afghanistan is difficult. Logistics are very difficult there. So you want to get the easiest project to do. And you also have to understand that there have been others before you doing work out there. There's organizations like Roots Peace doing work out there. And you have to understand where those technologies are, are in the in the adoption curve. If it's some new technology that's widespread here
combines like we have here, twice the yield in one year. I'm sorry, two years. Okay, very big impact, and the quality of the grapes jumps significantly as well. So it's a good thing. We started in the Shamali in 2005, and it's in full adoption. All the farmers want a trellis. They're all doing as fast as they can. In Kandahar, we started that two years ago, and it's now moving to a full adoption. You know, Zabel, which is just near, uh, near uh, Kandahar, these guys, we had to train them. Even though we drove them down to Kandahar, showed it to them and said, well, it's different here. It's a little higher elevation, or, or it's our mountains are a little higher, or whatever. You have to go through this adoption curve with people in different areas every time. So every new technology, go through this adoption curve. And then when we do things, I mentioned we did 20,000 orchards. We package everything in and get the farmer to sign an MOU that we're going to provide this tool and this fertilizer, and they're going to provide this labor. They're going to do the digging to get their field laid out. They're going to provide cash to pay, offset the costs. We package it all up, and then we find, sign, uh, sign up the farmers, and then we can manage the logistics very efficiently. So we were going to do 20,000 orchards in four years, and we ended up doing it in two years. So we've actually gotten pretty good at doing that. Educate the participants is very, very important. So it's not just the farmers. Uh, John went through some slides about farmers associations and other different groups. You need to brief everybody. And when we go out into an area, a new area, we'll go in and we'll brief the farmers. We, our guys will go into the afternoon prayers, and as the farmers come in for prayers, <clears throat> they'll, they'll say, hey, come down after, on the right steps here. I'm going to tell you about our program. So they'll have a good gathering there. They'll brief these guys, get some energy going, then they'll brief, brief the shura, brief the elders, get everyone there. We'll brief not only the legal government, but the other governments. There's a lot of other governments in Afghanistan. So we have to have links into all these guys, and we tell them, this is what we're doing. If you want us to work here, we'll work with you, and this is how we're going to do it. If you don't want us to work here, we'll go away. We have 150 districts we're working in. We don't need to work here. And every time they both said yes. And in the South, we brief the Taliban as well. And there's, there's governors in every district of the Taliban. So it's, part of it is that Afghans are, want to be involved, want to understand who's coming in their area. And it's, they're very territorial. Just want to know who's coming in. And this is basically saying, we're guests here. We're asking you permission to do this. So. Uh, and then working with, we work with the government, this is the government of the Republic, government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, and we work with mail. Now, mail is the central operation in Kabul. They basically don't really, at this point, are struggling to figure out how to do programs and how to help the Dales. The Dales actually report to the provincial governor. So this is a bit of a flaw in their system. So the Dales don't work for these guys here. So it's a little bit of an issue there. But if we're doing programs, we need to brief mail so they get their support and buy in on it. But we also need to work with the Dales and get them and their support. There's a lot of ways that we've done in the past to work with these guys. It's, we want to go out and do, let's say we're doing all these orchards. You know, it's, We only have so many extension agents. We go to the Dale and say, okay, we'll train your extension team and uh, have them work side by side with our guys to help do this. So they'll learn how to do this extension activity. And they go, okay. So they don't tell them we'll give them a per diem for $5 for lunch. And they say, yeah, they all sign up. So in our extension teams, they're typically uh, two roots apiece to one or one to one that we have Dale extensions working with us. So we've worked with all the extension guys all throughout the country, and, and they're starting to get to understand how to do things and how to get things done. So this is, this is the first level. Now with Agrid, we're working with the managers of these guys and saying, here, we need you to do this program. We need you to implement these new orchards, and we're going to monitor your quality. So that's, that's the level that I think you all should engage in if you're going to work in agriculture. 
work with the Dale, tell them what you want to accomplish, and then uh, monitor what they do. I'm just going to skip this one. Uh, quick question for you, see if you're still awake. Now, now just, I'm assuming you guys are going to the south, so grapes, pomegranates, almonds, melons are the southern crops. And that's where all the opium is going to. So which one makes the most money? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so grapes are number one. Uh, almonds, pomegranates are two and three. And I can't remember where this one go. And number 17 is opium. The, the perennial crops make a lot of money. Grapes on one hectare of land, that's two and a half acres, they will earn, if they're doing everything right and it's trellised, they will earn $16,000 a year net income. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Opium will make, the, the, at this historic high prices on the opium right now, they'll make about $4,000. Okay, so opium's pretty good, but the price of opium's dropping pretty fast right now. So by next season, it'll probably be about $2,000 for the opium. Sixteen. Where's the market that they would? Because I imagine that. So we're, we're doing that now. We, uh, last year we shipped 3,000 tons out. This next this season we're going to do probably 9,000 tons. So uh, What's the point of origin within Afghanistan. The point of origin, you mean as far as the the commercial like papers? How do they get them out of the country. Ka it's for Kandahar and Kabul are the two main points, and then the, the lesser one would be Jalalabad and Mazar up in the north. So if you've got grapes. Just one thing on grapes and some of the other perishable fruits like cherries or, or apricots, fresh apricots, you have to have them down at one or two degrees centigrade in an hour. So you've got to have them packed up, ready to go. So you do it at the location. So Kandahar is the biggest grape production place uh, area in, in Afghanistan. So we pack there and go straight south through, through uh, Quetta, or they come to Kabul and go the other road, road through um, Peshawar, depending on what's going on. Now, the, the more dangerous side is actually on the south side of the Afghan border. Uh, it's been bold back to Quetta and, and uh, Jalalabad to Peshawar. So that's what they decide. Okay, there's... Let's see. So here's opium here. This, is, this price has shifted down now. So there's actually a document that our team wrote uh, about this. It's on our website. It's comparative net income. Uh, here it is right here. RP crop income projection. You can get that on our website if you, you can see the, the details on that. So when we go in and work with farmers, we do a net income analysis on everything we do. And if we're telling a farmer to go in and we want you to, to dig the... the uh, dig out the, the trellis, the, the, the um, ditches between the grape vines. We want to relate that to how much dollars impact that's going to have and what he's doing. So this, this example is more of a summary one, but it's saying if you grow cherries, that you should expect to earn somewhere around $6,000. And then we give them the breakdown, saying, okay, this is how much you're going to sell the cherries for based on last year's prices, the cost you have to put in, this is the labor you have to do, and so they understand that. So we educate them on all these different crops, and then they pick which 
which uh, crop to grow, and they pick the varieties. This is typically how we do all of our programs. We give them the options, and then they select them. So we're just educated. We're not forced and saying, hey, you got to do this. If they want to do uh, vegetables, they, they're fine. Here's, here's the vegetables. You can pick where those, which ones you want to do there. Uh, now, when we do it this way, and when you can deliver that kind of information, they understand quickly. They really prize market information. So they'll make a decision fairly quickly. And our programs, and we, in all our programs, we ask the participants to pay half the cost. The, like in, for instance, the trees, they have to pay half the cost of the trees. So we go in and, and do this. We get oversubscribed in the programs every time. And uh, most other programs in Afghanistan give things away for free. Let me skip the tenant farmer thing here. So here's apricots. This is a case study and it's going to kind of talk you through this process. Uh, this is what the, what the dried apricots look like now that you get mostly. They harvest the apricots. 99% of the apricots are sold in that state. And they dry them on the roof or on the ground. They get down to like a leather consistency. And um, I think they cook with them most of the time. Very, very low cash value. They don't even bother to bring them into Kabul. They just keep it as a local product. So with simple procedures, we can get apricots similar to what you can get out of Turkey in California. So these are flats. So we borrowed the design from some uh, producers here. Simple flats. They set them out here. I think they stay in these flats for two or three days. You pick up the flat um, before. I got this two slides backwards. And you can see that these are all the flats stacked in here. And we're using sulfur to preserve the color and eliminate the molds on the fruit. Uh, it's a very simple process. That's just visqueen on you know, a bunch of two by fours. And we just get a, a sulfur stick, put it in a little bowl, light it, let it sit there for a little while, pull it out, set it in the sun, pinch the seed out, and a couple of days there, and then they're done. Very, very simple process, very simple intervention. They get big impact on the dollars. They, they've created a cash crop now. So there's a lot of apricots. There are apricots in every part of the country. So you guarantee that the, there'll be apricots in where you're working. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I can just add to that. That's, sure. That's actually come up uh, uh, requests from, from folks in the field saying that uh, in my community, they can't sell all their, their fresh apricots. That uh, we've got uh, quite, quite a few left over. Is there, is there some way we can yeah. add some value to these? So again, this is a chance to yeah. uh, uh, hook in with Gary, as you say, and other groups that, that have worked on this, and they can, they can help you out with it. Sure. I mean, it's, so the fresh apricots sell at a pretty good price. So they'd want to sell as many as they can fresh, and then whatever's left over before they go bad, and stick them in this process. So this, we'd go in and we'd set this thing up and uh, just this whole setup is like our $50, I think is, uh, and multiple farmers can use the same thing. So the process, the, the sulfur process is fairly fast, so they just can rotate through this, these things through fairly quickly. And you can see there's nothing fancy about this construction. They could build this right in their, out of their own materials. And they have carpenters there that could take regular supply, regular wood, and create those flats. You, you know, nothing you have to import. You can do everything there. It's, it's also a lot of women get involved in this. We typically train uh, both the men and the women together on those. So you, you were asking a question about grapes. These are the 
the grapevines down here. And they're on these earthen mounds, and that's really kind of the structure they've built up. The water is irrigated between those, those mounds, and the vines kind of grow over them. This thing over here is called a Kishmish Kana, or raisin drying barn. They produce green raisins in, in Kandahar. And the green raisins sell for a high price, and they actually taste really good. They're more like a, uh, a dried grape than a raisin. You don't get the prunish flavor. So this, this process is that they could go in, and that's the, the inside of these uh, Kishmish Kana's. They just dry the, the bunches of grapes. They tie, link two of them together and just hang it over a bamboo rod. Uh, this is an improved process for hanging. You get twice as many grapes in there as uh, with their normal process. Very simple process. With the designs for this are on our website. We also have an improved version of this Kishmish Khan. It's made out of bricks. Uh, the, the Kishmish Khan is made out of mud or really, um, they could only do one cycle of grapes per year, per season. The, our new design could do two, so it's twice as much, which is a good thing. Uh, but also, if you look at this, for farming, this is really bad. This thing's made out of mud. It's actually been made out of all the topsoil from this whole area. So that's how they make it. If you want to put another one in here, they go in and scrape all the best dirt and they create this barn. So the new process is much, much better. These things are all throughout Kandahar and Helmand. So here again, we do everything in a package. It's in the development stages early on. We do it, you pick lead farmers, you, take, you pick the best farmers. Don't go out and pick you know, the, the charity case. Get somebody who's really good and who's admired by their community. And then spread it out. Get the Dales involved so that they could continue this training and continue these demos. Almonds, a lot of almonds in the country. Grapes are the number one, grapes and raisins, number one product. Almonds are number two. And simple things that are done here in America are not necessarily done there yet. They think bees, in a lot of the areas, in the more remote areas still, they think bees are taking the life out of the trees. They don't quite understand the pollination process. We introduced bees and got stunning results. This is a quick hit thing. You have to do it in the spring, obviously. But if you just arrange for, to bring bees into fields at, at flowering time, the fruit set, which you're going to be able to count very easily and very visibly, is going to be much higher uh, with the pollination. It's an accepted practice here in America. In California, we actually, all of our bees have problems. Imported them from Michigan or somewhere else, but they come in truckloads of bees. And every orchard here is pollinated in this way. <laughs> Big impact. Very short time, very visible, very cheap. One of my favorite ones. Yeah, you don't need that. A lot of projects here. There's some more projects that you have. So a lot of these ones I went through are very simple ones. Uh, but there's also ones you know, that laser leveling can really improve yields in an annual crop. If you imagine a, a, a field with a little bit of a tilt, you know, it's, it's irrigated and fertilized. All the fertilizer is going to run down to the end, and all the seeds and going to go down. The best soil is going to run down. If you flatten things out, it stays in put, and you have a more even uh, production, much better yields on things. But that's it's a costly intervention. But you can do that through a farmers association. And we we introduced uh, 75 75 horsepower tractors. Uh, in, in Mazar and in Bamiyan. And these had all the, the plug-in attachments in the back, threshers and all kinds of stuff. And it's a $15,000 package, pretty expensive. And these things were a huge hit. We taught the farmer associations how to, to figure out the cost of operation, including depreciation, which is a huge thing. And then they rented it out to their members. And that, they had this thing, the first one I saw, it was booked out for the entire season. They had it all timing, all set up, and they were going to easily have money enough to buy a replacement tractor in the future. So there's ways to do things. Just have to figure out the best way on this. So 
Collaboration is a good thing. Um, I want to do a little drawing here. So really the emphasis, I mean, you guys are going to be hearing the word transition a lot, right? So, so if you, you got your dale and we're, you know, the idea is to let's start running more and more things through the dales. Uh, you're over here and there's a whole bunch of farmers over here that you got some ideas of what you want to work with on. What's been done in the past is, is we've gone straight to these guys, bypassed them, Roots pieces, you know, got some of their extension workers to work with this, but pretty much it was just direct. What we, in the future, what we should be doing is we want to run things through Dale, but if you guys, if you go in and say, okay, well, here's the money, go talk to those guys, you'll never see the money again at this point. So what's, there's a kind of a, a transition stage, I think, that we're in now, is you engage with the Dale and you work either directly or through some kind of intermediary to run the funds through and have the Dale as involvement on the project side and project management and have either the Dale managing if it's a fairly simple operation, it's more complex, maybe recruit some organization to help do the work. assets and dollars go directly over here. Someday in the future, that will be the process, coming through Dale and over here. They're not there yet. Any question? That, that intermediary organization, is that, those are like uh, the guys who pay for the slides to be made and then hand it off to you. those guys. What, what does that look like in your experience? These guys, will, depending on the complexity of the project and it's the size of the project, a small one, there's a lot of Afghan NGOs that are starting to do these things. So that, that would probably be the best thing to get an Afghan NGO to do this. Saying you want trainers, you know, you need training, you want delivery of this package, you want farmers signing on the MOU and you want to see those MOUs back. And the Dale's involvement is on the project management side. You know, working with them on where these are going to go, which areas you work in, you know, what's the process, how do they communicate this stuff. Um, and then this is your implementer because these guys just don't have the implementation horsepower at this point. But you want to get commitment that they're going to provide the Dale Extension guys involved in this process as well. So I've been talking a lot about uh, farmers contributing to the cost of the, of the implementations. This is very important. And, and the reason I have a special slide for it is because unfortunately the biggest abusers were the US military. They come in and they have very short time frames and uh, they get there, it takes a couple months to get going, then they figure out their funding and then they're down to a few months and they think we've got to get this project done so we're going to give these things away. These are, this comparison is two different programs. The top one is Roots of Peace. All right, I can show you how great we are. But the other one is another company I'll leave unnamed. They were doing a project in the same area at the same time, doing the same thing. We were promoting new orchards in, in the eastern region. Okay? We were doing one million trees. Another organization was doing the same thing. They were doing one million trees. Okay? And uh, over time, when the farmers really didn't invest, since they got it for free, they didn't say, oh, it's free. You know, I'm, it works, it works, let's stick it out there. They didn't really invest much time in learning what the trees were, which varieties were right, or how to plant. Uh, they just they got the trees for free, 
threw them on their shoulders and literally walked to their farm, stuck them in the ground. They were wheat farmers. They just kind of dug a little hole, stuck it right there. And they were wheat farmers with a bunch of sticks out in, the, in their orchard. 50% after the first year had died. Okay? After that, they got down to around 30%. That's no longer an orchard. That was a waste of money. Okay? So if you take money from the farmer, <coughs> they are asking, well, shoot, if I give you money, how do I know if I get the right trees? Which is the right trees should I buy? What's the right variety? How do I plant? How to make sure these don't die? And these are all the right questions we have. And whenever we go into a new area or a new country, we do the same thing. And I stood up in front of a group of Vietnamese women who were going to be planting black pepper. And they were just haranguing me for hours. We don't have enough money to do this. You know, it's all on and on and on. And after saying no to them, like the hundredth time, they finally, one woman says, well, how, if I do this, how do you know my, the plants you give me are not going to die right away? You know, and then they start asking those questions. Then they became a commercial farmer. That's the process. So do not give trees away. Do not give anything away. They will treat it as worthless. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a tree or a bicycle or a motorcycle. Same thing. They've got to be investing. They have to be at risk. If they fail, if they fail, they fail. It's not, they don't come running back to us and say, oh, my trees died. Oh, the only trees died. You better go buy some more. You know, it's their failure. And so... Our programs are very sustainable right from the beginning because we design it that way. They say, here's what you're doing, and we ask them, okay, your trees died, what happened? And we go trace through it, and we find out what he did wrong. We don't, we usually we find out well before that, well, your, your trees are struggling here, and then try and correct it. Uh, so if a farmer is struggling, we're not a charity organization in working with the farmers. They have got to produce and, and succeed there. So I think this is my last slide. So here's my email address. I welcome emails from any of you if you've got questions on what you're going to do. And you do find out what area you're going to, uh, or you know, I have information on this. I could direct you to other organizations uh, who do this. There's been a lot of uh, experts that have gone over the country. So there is an expert on every one of these things we've talked about somewhere. And the network of Afghan hands, you know, including Mark and John, and well, they, if you connect into one of us, we could link you over to the guy who wrote the book on this stuff. So you, you don't have to become experts in this stuff. You could just get a little bit of knowledge and understand kind of what are the opportunities, and then we could link you into uh, guys who really know this stuff. Or, or you do the ask an expert at the Afghan ad and get them to answer the questions. All right. Any questions for this? Jerry's only here today. He's yeah. got to head back up to the, uh, the Bay Area shortly, so... Sure. I'll be around here for a few minutes before I go here. Okay. Good luck when you guys go over there. <laughs>